When Flutter has come to invade my comments section, there is one name that pops up the most as a formidable opponent, one in which I apparently shouldn't be able to debunk. It is, of course, the founding father of modern day Flutter, Eric Dubay. For some reason, he seems to be some sort of Flat Earth messiah, and the, the requests to do a video on him have been numerous. So spotting a video he did about the seasons was my perfect opportunity. Is it some serious Flat Earth proof? Or a load of old horseshite? Let's find out. In the Flat Earth model, the Sun and Moon luminaries revolve around the Earth once every 24 hours for the Sun, and approximately 25 hours for the Moon, illuminating like spotlights the areas over which they pass. The sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length and character of days, nights, and seasons. This is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while higher latitudes north and especially south experience more distinct seasons with harsh winters. So the seasons are caused by the sun periodically moving closer and further away from the North Pole. Right, okay. This photo is of a solar analema taken at exactly 7.30 a.m. from the exact same location all year round. If your confident explanation of the movement of the sun is correct, why then does the sun not change size throughout the year? Surely if the sun is physically moving away from you as the year progresses, it should look smaller, should it not? I'll give you a clue as to why it doesn't. Because your explanation and your model is wrong. Well, to begin with, many other annual solar analemma time-lapse photos taken at the same time of day over the course of a year do show the sun changing its apparent size, so a better question is, why have you, sci-fi scam man Dan, cherry-picked this one particular picture where the sun doesn't change its apparent size? Why have you ignored all analemma photos that do show size changes and only presented your audience with one such picture where it doesn't? Furthermore, if the picture you chose is authentic, then how do you explain the fact that the entire solar disk can be seen in front of the building obscuring the corner of the roof on July 5th? The same thing happens on the undated sun appearing between December 22nd and January 1st, which appears closer than the tree in the foreground. In reality, the sun does change its apparent size all the time, based on a variety of atmospheric conditions and atmospheric lensing. When light of any kind shines through a dense medium, it appears larger, or rather gives a greater glare, at a given distance than when it is seen through a lighter medium. This is more remarkable when the medium holds aqueous particles or vapor in solution, as in a damp or foggy atmosphere. You can see this by standing within a few yards of a street lamp and noticing the size of the light. On going away to many times the distance, the light upon the atmosphere will appear considerably larger. This phenomenon may be noticed to a greater or lesser degree at all times, but when the air is moist and vapory, it is more intense. It is evident that at sunrise and at sunset, the sun's light must shine through a greater length of atmospheric air than at midday, besides which the air near the earth is both more dense and holds more watery particles in solution than the higher strata through which the sun shines at noonday, and hence the light must be dilated or magnified as well as modified in color. So the sun, as it sets towards the horizon, from a viewer's perspective on earth, simultaneously gets bigger due to the reason given above, and smaller due to the law of perspective. The net result is what you see. Notice how the distant lights have a brighter and bigger glare, even though they're further away. Many contributing factors, including wavelength, diffraction, air pressure, air temperature, width of aperture, altitude, humidity, and clarity, all contribute to the net result. The amount to which the sun and moon will be magnified, due to the above reasons, and shrink due to the law of perspective, will depend on all of the above. Enature.com writes, The moon's warm color when seen at lower angles is caused by the relatively larger amount of atmosphere through which one is observing it as compared to when the moon is right overhead. This additional atmosphere scatters the bluish component of the light of the moon, making the low-lying moon appear redder to the observer's eyes. If you look later when the moon is higher above the horizon, you'll see it appears much whiter than earlier in the evening. It does change, and the changes are mostly due to the atmosphere. So I can show you a picture of the sun setting in the desert where it's very dry, 
and you'll see the sun shrink and shrink into a tiny, tiny pinprick before it disappears into the horizon. And then I can show you another video of on a more over the ocean, say, on a more humid day, the sun is going to actually expand a little bit due to the atmosphere and then disappear into the horizon like a big ball, as, as you, many people have seen it. But either way that it disappears, whether it disappears into a pinprick before leaving the horizon or it expands and, and goes down the horizon, it's simply moving away from your perspective, as we talked about. It's not actually going down, just like a row of street lamps aren't getting shorter and shorter as they get farther and farther away from you. It's just an element of perspective. The heliocentric model claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the sun. Their flawed current model even places us closest to the sun, 91,400,000 miles, in January, when it is actually winter, and farthest from the sun, 94,500,000 miles in July, when it's actually summer throughout much of the Earth. They say due to the ball Earth's tilt, different places receive different amounts of direct sunlight, and that is what produces the seasonal and temperature changes. This makes little sense, however, because if the sun's heat travels over 90 million miles to reach the ball Earth, how could a slight tilt, a mere few thousand miles maximum, negate the sun's 90 million mile journey, giving us simultaneous tropical summers and Antarctic winters. Thomas Winship said, The Earth is a stretched out structure which diverges from the central north in all directions towards the south. The equator, being midway between the north center and the southern circumference, divides the course of the sun into north and south declination. The longest circle around the world, which the sun makes, is when it has reached its greatest southern declination. Gradually going northwards, the circle is contracted. In about three months after, the southern extremity of its path has been reached, the sun makes a circle around the equator. Still pursuing a northerly course as it goes round and above the world, in another three months, the greatest northern declination is reached, when the sun again begins to go towards the south. Aruga! Aruga! We've got another Northern Hemisphere chauvinist, people. Eric, you do realise that, yes, we are close to the sun during the winter here in the Northern Hemisphere, but that is summer in the Southern Hemisphere. One hemisphere isn't more important than the other. Besides, the notion that temperature changes here on Earth is related to the minute difference in our distance to the sun is simply laughable. I often accuse flat earthers of two-dimensional thinking. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to accuse him of one-dimensional thinking. If I was to shine a torch directly over a given surface, almost all of that light would be concentrated in a single spot. Now, if I was to shine that torch at a shallower angle, the same amount of light would be spread over a larger surface area. That means you would be getting less energy hitting the surface per square centimetre. Let's now apply that to the sun. During the summer solstice here in the UK, let's say London, the sun reaches an altitude of almost 62 degrees. During the winter solstice, that altitude only reaches 15 degrees. That is a significant difference. In fact, during the summer here in the UK, we receive over twice the amount of solar energy per square metre. Now, what sort of a difference is that going to make to the local climate? Because during the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, when we are one side of the sun, the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards it, Six months later, when we've moved halfway around our orbit, the Northern Hemisphere is then tilted away from the Sun. It matches reality quite well, I'd say. If this was true, and Earth's supposed tilt allowed for equal amounts of sunlight in the Arctic and Antarctic, then we should reasonably expect to see similar conditions and characteristics, such as comparable temperatures, seasonal changes, length of daylight, plant and animal life, in both places. In reality, however, the Arctic and Antarctic regions and areas of comparable latitude north and south of the equator differ greatly in many ways. Antarctica is by far the coldest place on Earth, with an average annual temperature of approximately negative 57 degrees Fahrenheit and a record low of 135.8. The average annual temperature at the North Pole, however, is a comparatively warm 4 degrees, Throughout the year, temperatures in the Antarctic vary less than half the amount at comparable Arctic latitudes. The northern Arctic region enjoys moderately warm summers and manageable winters, whereas the southern Antarctic region never even warms enough to melt the perpetual snow and ice. Thomas Winship wrote, This uniformity of temperature partly accounts for the great accumulation of ice which is formed not on account of the great severity of the winter, but because there is practically no summer to melt it. In the Antarctic, there is eternal winter and snow never melts. 
As far north as a man has traveled, he has found reindeer and hare basking in the sun, and country brilliant with rich flora. Within the Antarctic Circle, no plant is to be found. The island of Kerguelen, at 49 degrees southern latitude, has only 18 species of native plants that can survive its hostile climate. Compare this with the island of Iceland, at 65 degrees northern latitude. 16 degrees further north of the equator than Kerguelen is south, yet Iceland is home to 870 species of native plants. On the Isle of Georgia, just 54 degrees southern latitude, the same latitude as Canada or England in the north, where dense forests of various tall trees abound, the infamous Captain Cook wrote that he was unable to find a single shrub large enough to make a toothpick. Cook wrote, Not a tree was to be seen. The lands which lie to the south are doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness, never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, whose horrible and savage aspect I have not words to describe. Even marine life is sparse in certain tracts of vast extent, and the seabird is seldom observed flying over such lonely wastes. The contrasts between the limits of organic life in Arctic and Antarctic zones is very remarkable and significant. Vegetables and land animals are found at nearly 80 degrees in the north, while from the parallel of 58 degrees in the south, the lichen and such-like plants only clothe the rocks, and seabirds and the cetaceous tribes alone are seen upon the desolate beaches. In the Arctic there are four clearly distinguished seasons, warm summers, and an abundance of plant and animal life, none of which can be said of the Antarctic. The Eskimo live as far north as the 79th parallel, whereas in the south no native man is found higher than the 56th. W. and R. Chambers in Arctic Explorations wrote, Beyond the 70th degree of southern latitude, not a tree meets the eye. Wearied with the white waste of snow, forests, woods, even shrubs have disappeared, and given place to a few lichens and creeping woody plants, which scantily clothe the indurated soil. Still, in the farthest north, nature claims her birthright of beauty, and in the brief and rapid summer she brings forth numerous flowers and grasses to bloom for a few days, to be again blasted by the swiftly recurring winter. The rapid fervor of an arctic summer had already, June 1st, converted the snowy waste into luxuriant pasture ground, rich in flowers and grass, with almost the same lively appearance as that of an English meadow. In the flat earth model of the cosmos, these Arctic and Antarctic phenomena are easily accounted for and exactly what would be expected. If the sun circles over and around the earth every 24 hours, steadily traveling from tropic to tropic every six months, it follows that the northern, central region would annually receive far more heat and sunlight than the southern circumferential region. Since the sun must sweep over the larger southern region in the same 24 hours it has to pass over the smaller northern region, its passage must necessarily be proportionally faster as well. This is why the Antarctic morning dawn and evening twilight are very abrupt, whereas in extreme north twilight continues for hours after sunset, and many midsummer nights the sun does not set at all. Dr. Samuel Robotham said, If the sun is fixed and the earth revolves underneath it, the same phenomena would exist at the same distance on each side of the equator. But such is not the case. What can operate to cause the twilight in New Zealand to be so much more sudden, or the nights so much colder than in England? The southern hemisphere cannot revolve more rapidly than the northern. The latitudes are about the same, and the distance round a globe would be the same at 50 degrees south as at 50 degrees north. And as the whole would revolve once in 24 hours, the surface at the two places would pass underneath the sun with the same velocity, and the light would approach in the morning and recede in the evening in exactly the same manner. Yet the very contrary is the fact. The constant sunlight of the north develops, with the utmost rapidity, numerous forms of vegetable life, and furnishes subsistence for millions of living creatures. But in the south, where the sunlight never dwells, or lingers about a central region, but rapidly sweeps over sea and land, to complete in twenty-four hours the great circle of the southern circumference, it has not time to excite and stimulate the surface, and therefore, even in comparatively low southern latitudes, everything wears an aspect of desolation. These differences in the north and south could not exist if the earth were a globe, turning upon axes underneath a non-moving sun.
the two hemispheres would at the same latitudes have the same degree of light and heat, and the same general phenomena, both in kind and degree. The peculiarities which are found in the south as compared with the north are only such as could exist upon a stationary plane, having a northern center, concentric with which is the path of the moving sun. This is word salad of the highest quality, make no mistake. Orbiting the sun, a globular shape, and axial tilt are the reasons why there are seasons. No scientific textbook will ever say it's because of our distance to the sun at any point in our orbit. I believe you call that one a straw man argument. No, it's called critical thinking. A straw man argument is what you set up with your questionable solar analemma photo earlier. What you're witnessing here is an example of a sovereign-minded individual, unblinded by heliocentric pseudoscience, critically examining the claim that summer solstice and the highest recorded temperatures on Earth happen when the globe is allegedly farthest away from the sun. Lastly, Dan rambles off a list of geologic processes which he claims, with no evidence, somehow explain all the radical flora, fauna, seasonal, and temperature differences between the Arctic and Antarctic. Well, no shit. The North Pole is on a sheet of ice that sits on water, and the South Pole is an enormous quantity of ice that sits on a continent. To expect them to be exactly the same is just silly. He rambles on more about the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic regions, and that there shouldn't be any differences at all if the Earth was a globe. Well, to start with, we don't expect them to be exactly the same, but what Mr. DeVay doesn't understand is there is so much more to think about when looking at these regions. Our orbit around the Sun is but a tiny factor amongst many. You need to look at the temperature difference between the equator and each pole, how water and land absorb and emit radiation differently, the air and water currents around each pole, the local geography surrounding the polar regions, the depth of the ocean below the Arctic, the land mass below the Antarctic, the albedo effect, the ice thickness at each pole, etc, etc, etc. So he says there are many factors I'm not considering that cause this, and the very first one he lists is, you need to look at the temperature difference between the equator and the pole. Telling someone to look at the temperature differences between the equator and the pole is not providing evidence, nor a contributing factor to anything. I'm well aware of the temperature differences, and I've presented them in my books and videos showing how they are wildly inconsistent with the globe model. Dan then lists several other things I allegedly need to look into, which he again claims with no evidence will somehow explain away all the heliocentric model's problems. Eric, you have a lot to learn. If you could stop reading old books written by scientific illiterates, that would be great. And then stop uploading videos about the content of those books, that would be good too. Oh, and don't forget to enroll in a local astronomy course. That would help. Sci-fi scam man Dan, you too have a lot to learn. If you could stop listening to Freemasonic liars in lab coats and spacesuits, that would be great. And then stop uploading videos where you repeat verbatim everything you were indoctrinated with since kindergarten, that would be good too. Oh, and don't forget to sign up for IFERS, the International Flat Earth Research Society. That would help.